We'll just have a, a short chat, you and I. I've got a couple of areas that I'd love you to elaborate on. Um, that that first that point that you made about Ramaphosa being worth 11% to the ANC in 2019 is, is one that I'm not so sure too many people have worked into the notes, into their, their projections. But can you give us any insight? Are you allowed to tell us anything on how you're reading the polls at the moment, given that you've got this big project that you're doing with, with ETB? Sorry, how? Well, maybe just how are you seeing May 29 at this point? Well, um, uh, the big phenomenon is clearly the rise of MK. And he, the worry I have about our survey is that this is uh, something which is going on. It's growing explosively. Um, Look, I'll leak one or two things to you. Uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, we have the ANC at 13, 1, 3, and MK at 36. Uh, so you can see what's going on there. Uh, but equally, it, what is very striking is that Zuma's appeal is also strong in Mpumalanga. And uh, so I think I'm, the only other province where, where the, the MK is doing anything of any significance is how tank. But there it's more like sort of five or six percent. But uh, overall, that puts MK at around 11 for the country as a whole, uh, which of course is a decisive number because it takes the ANC away from the possibility of having any hope of a coalition with small parties because there won't be enough. So. Basically, it doesn't, I mean, what, what it shows really is that, that the choice is going to be either an ANC-EFF coalition or an ANC-MK coalition. That could also be numerically possible or an ANC-DA coalition. Those are the three possibilities now. Uh, and, and that's really been made um, certain by the rise of MK. I mean, that really has, uh, what we... What is not clear is really, I mean, they've clearly taken away enormously from the AMC in, in KZN. It looks like they're also hurting EFF to some degree. Um, the thing that is striking to me is that at its peak, the AMC was around two thirds. If you now add up the three parts of the AMC family, which is AMC, EFF, and MK, they come to two thirds. So what has happened is that party is split into three. And <laughs> the thing that I cannot but remember is how during the early years of the AMC's dominance, many, many people, especially DA supporters, uh, would uh, talk rather hopefully and longingly of how one day the AMC must split. Well, I think, you know, you must be wary of what you wish for because that's now happened and I'm not sure that the results are going to cheer people up at <laughs> all. The Eastern Cape, before we move off the subject, Gaten McKenzie said that Jacob Zuma is more popular in the Eastern Cape than he is uh, in KZN. Well, I, that's not borne out by the data I'm looking at. What is certainly true is that um, if you ask people about how favorable they are to Jacob Zuma, then he does quite well in Eastern Cape. Uh, so there is potential there. It's as if there's a sort of Nguni solidarity, not just Zulu, but you know, obviously most powerful among the Zulus. But um, that is not mirrored by any good performance by the MK in Eastern Cape that I've looked at. Though, frankly, if they get campaigning down there, that could change, I suppose. Those are, those are big numbers, 36 to 13, way, way different to even the most optimistic projections that we've seen for MK. In, for instance, the bread toast uh, poll that came out the other day. A few people, I also had a stockbroker uh, giving me information. They said the bread toast numbers were not credible. What you're telling us now appears to support that. Well, I mean, our numbers are higher than the Brent Hurst ones, actually. But it is a case that had. one thing I should say is that um, the, the, what the data shows is that 
you know, when people talk about dissidents within South Africa, they usually come around fairly quickly to talking about Western Cape secession as a sort of possibility. Now, quite clearly, if you're going to get either an MK-ANC coalition or an EFF-ANC coalition, it would greatly strengthen secessionist uh, feelings across the board, no doubt. But if you just look at the data, you would say that the province which is in the state of revolt and rebellion is KZN, not the Western Cape. And that on all sorts of um, indices, it's the most radical. Uh, I mean, when you ask people about um, how much confidence they have in the ANC, in KZN, it's under six. <laughs> I mean, it's just gone, you know. And the, 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 the absolute fury against the government, which you can see in many of the responses, is much stronger in KZN. You, you would actually think that was the province on the verge of secession. Mr. Tlabisa had an interesting uh, talk yesterday. He was particularly uh, impressive when he deviated from his script, where in much of his script he was talking about Prince Butelezi and the bad rap he's been getting. But he came across as a very uh, as a leader with great integrity and, and for some people, potentially a, a president. Clearly the numbers you're giving us so that's not going to happen. But how's the IFP doing in its home province? Oh, they, they were up. Uh, they, they were doing quite well in KZN. I've forgotten the actual number. I think it was around 19 or 20 there. Uh, so it was definitely better than they'd been before. But um, the, I mean, it's very splintered. You've got ANC, MK, DA, IFP. I mean, that's four large blocks. Uh, in that province, and no one in the size of 50, you know. So um, it, it's all over the place. But no, IFP are, are certainly have, have recovered ground. The stockbrokers report, and they, they've been working at it for some time. They are advising clients on the basis of it, and they talk about 4,000 interviews they did. They sure. give a lot of, it's a stockbroking firm. They've kept it mm. uh, uh, confidential. But they're giving a lot of uh, a lot more support to the smaller parties. Now it was interesting one of, when you were saying in the beginning that the the structure of South Africa's politic, uh, political uh, well political structure here will support smaller parties in time. Are you seeing the Action SA uh, Patriotic Alliance? Maybe those smaller parties getting ground or getting a lot of ground in this election? No. Um, basically, I mean, the problem is this, you see, that if we did a sample of 3,000, except for the most important questions, we did seven, 6,000 to, to double it up and make the margin smaller. Now, the small parties come out very poorly, but the problem is that that means they're a very small part of your sample, which means that the margin of error is much higher when you're talking about small numbers. And, uh, I mean, look, I'll, I'll give you another leak, which is that um, on our numbers, the DA is going to be the biggest party in the Northern Cape. Now, the trouble is the Northern Cape is such a small population that, again, the sample size there is small. So the margin of error is very high. So I can't be certain of that result, you know. But, um, no, the problem, look, what one realizes is that the electoral system makes it very easy to break through. But the barriers are not only the number of signatures you've got to get, which has made it difficult for a number of parties. As you know, it finished off Roger Jardine. Um, but it's actually the hard slog of setting up party organizations, recruiting members, fundraising, etc. It's a tremendously hard slog. And I, I can remember, you know, talking to James Self, who was then the chairman of the DA, at the time when COPE was launched. And I said, what do you think about that? And he said, oh, well, I wish them luck. So I said, really? Uh, even though they're competitors. He said, listen, we were nearly wiped out in 94. And after that, Tony Leon and I and a couple of others, we had to slog away for years, setting up branches, getting fundraising going. It was the hardest work of my life. And we did it, you know? 
and now it's all right. But, oh, my God, I never want to go through that again. So anyone else who's volunteering for that, good luck to them. You know? And that was his attitude. And I think that all the small parties underestimate just how tough that is. And the DA in this election, where are you putting them? They were coming out more or less as before. Uh, the the, the Brenthurst poll was giving them something very fancy in the high 20s. We saw no sign of I mean, it was all like 2021. Okay, we have our 20 minutes audience participation. If you'd like to put your hand up, there's a hand over here. On this side of the room, when you get the microphone, please just stand up and ask your question. Mr. Johnson, thank you for your usual erudite um, wisdom for us to learn from. Um, I just want a simple question. Do you see this election as, as the end of democracy or whatever it is at the moment for South Africa? No, no, I don't. Um, we did ask questions about this. Um, and it, it's quite true that when you ask people, you know, how do you think the ANC would react to the loss of power? There's no great popular confidence that they will behave democratically. Uh, there's a strong feeling that they'll find a way of staying in power, whatever. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't feel that. I think this is a, a stage in uh, our political development, but you know, there will be other stages. Um, so I don't feel that, but uh, look, it's obviously worrying that MK has been making threats of misbehavior. And of course, they're in a very strange position because it's illegal for Zuma to be head of the ticket because he's been sentenced to 15 months in jail. And that means he's ineligible. So the IEC has got a big problem what it's going to do about that. But of course, given the fact that Zuma is quite popular and is universally known, uh, there's no other way that the, the MK are going to have anyone else on the front of their ballot or on their posters. So, you know, that's already a, a rather strange situation. And it's pretty clear that the people who organized the 2021 riots are involved in organizing MK. Uh, and, you know, they're quite good at what they do. Uh, so um, they're quite formidable, I think. But we, we don't know how they're going to react. And uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for um, uh, EFF because I think they had very high hopes in this election and MK is going to put a break on those. Although EFF will gain. There's little doubt about that. Um, any sign that Russia will interfere with the election or is interfering with the election to tip the scales, given the socialistic connections to the ANC? No, there's no sign that I can see. Uh, but of course, I wouldn't expect to see it in the data. Uh, that, you know, Look, if there were going to be covert help from abroad, you would find it more in social media and in financial contributions, things which by definition will be half hidden or fully hidden. So it... You know, when I'm not going to have any special way of knowing about that. But what is your gut telling you on that front, on Russian? When, when, and I've mentioned this before at this conference. When Malema stands up and says Putin is us, we are Putin, and when uh, a, a co-founder of the Scorpions maintains that it's the Russian secret service that is funding MK. Well, these are just guesses, you know. What is certainly true is that it's clear that uh, Putin's, uh, the group around him, have decided some time ago that, you know, that the ANC has to stay in power in uh, South Africa. It's become quite important to them. And uh, so I would expect them to lend support of one sort or another. But it's not visible to me what that is at the moment. The side of the rope. Yeah. That is lady here. 
You know, I get to do the Lisa Johnson all the time. No, Alec. I know. She's here. Yeah. I get to talk to you all the time and you guys don't get this option. So please use it. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Hello. I'd like to know your opinion about Gabe McKenzie. Do you think he is the forceful character that... Sorry, I'm not understanding that very well. Do I think... That... Gaten McKenzie, your opinion of him, and do you think he is the forceful character that South Africa needs now? The, the question was, Gaten McKenzie, yeah. what do you think of him, your opinion of him, and is he the kind of leader South Africa needs now, forceful leader? Well, I don't think I should give personal opinions uh, of that, but... Look, all I can say is that, um, look, he's a forceful figure. It's, it's difficult to judge what um, his party is going to do because they've done quite well at municipal level, uh, but there isn't much sign of that at national level, uh, certainly not with the data I've seen. Uh, but, and there are parties like that, you see. I mean, you get these local parties like ECOSA, which does quite well in local elections in the Western Cape, but is invisible at uh, national level. So that we don't know yet whether that's going to be true of the Patriotic Alliance. But um, look, the, the caliber of our leadership is not high at the moment uh, in, in any uh, respect at all. Uh, I don't think any of the parties are as well led now as they have been in the past, you know. I don't think I think that's true of the DA. I think it's true of the ANC. I think it's true of uh, quite a lot of the parties. Uh, so this does create an opening for um, other new parties. And look, he, he's got a following within the coloured community. There's little doubt about that. But um, I would be surprised if that were a lasting factor. You know, we have had this phenomenon over and over again of, the first election. Cope did quite well in its first election, and after that it faded away. The same has been true of other good, for example, doesn't look like it's going to do very much. Uh, you know, the, it, it's a one election wonder sort of thing, and we have to see whether or not that's going to be true. You don't know. What about the... Pro Sorry. Yeah, yeah. carry on. Uh, Mr. Jackson, thanks so much for your, your speech. Um, just with regards to what the past sort of five, six speakers have said with regards to this election, do you believe it is a make and break election for South Africa or is there more, more time to fix this nation? Do I think? Do you think that this is a make or break election for South Africa as some of the politicians have been positioning it? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I have to say yes and no. No, because life will go on, the political system will go on, and, you know, it's not the end of the world, whatever happened. Uh, but where, you, where, where it is make or break is, I mean, what, what the data shriek out very, very loudly is that there is obviously a, a tremendous disillusionment in the country. And, uh, I mean, one question which we asked was about, if you look at the record of the ANC over 30 years, do you feel... Uh, dissatisfied with what they did, very dissatisfied, or are you satisfied or very satisfied, and so forth, you see. So to try to get a picture of how people feel overall about the ANC's performance. Now, given that the ANC were around about 40 uh, nationally, you think, well, you know, that they're obviously going to get 40, four out of every 10 are going to say that they're satisfied. Not at all. Uh, the ratio of dissatisfied to satisfied was nine to one, including ANC. Think of that. Nine to one is, is a hideous, huge landslide of dissatisfaction. Now, that is clear right across the board in all the data that the uh, feeling of, of upset with the ANC and the feeling of disappointment is enormously strong, which is, of course, why... MK and EFF, they've got this tremendous following win of that dissatisfaction. That's why they was pumping those parties up, you know. So in that sense, there is this very, very strong mood. And I suppose, you know, the most likely result, as I say, is that we're going to have 
a, a government which will be ANC plus something or other. And for a lot of the electorate, that's going to be a very, very upsetting result because that degree of dissatisfaction and then to find that party still the dominant one in power is going to be a very disappointing result. What about a government of national unity? It has been raised a couple of times at this conference already where you would have the FPC getting together with the ANC after the election. Um, well, look, the nearest thing to a government of national unity would be ANCDA because uh, the DA is strong among all the minorities and the business community and so on. So uh, it's... It's quite interesting that um, when, when you ask people about who would you like to be in coalition, uh, the DA come out best uh, among all voters uh, with more favorable than unfavorable. And that includes the ANC. If you say, would you like to see the ANC in coalition, there are more people saying, no, they don't want it than are saying they want it, um, which is... You know, quite remarkable. So the DA are actually more popular as a coalition partner with the ANC at the moment. But uh, when you ask people why, there is this strong feeling that it would be good to have the white business community and the minorities sort of in support and that that will give you more possibilities uh, of doing a better job. I mean, that, that feeling exists not only among DA voters, but quite a lot of you know, in general. Are there any parallels in history to where we are now in South Africa and elsewhere in the world that we can draw on for, for perhaps inspiration? Well, I, I don't know of any. I can't think of any. Um, obviously, you, you have had the phenomenon in many African countries where an African nationalist party is utterly dominant at first and then loses its way and so forth. What is very striking to me is that, as I said to you in the talk, that the, the National Party vote peaked 29 years after they got into power. The ANC vote peaked in 2004 after 10 years. So the whole process is, you know, concertinaed uh, with the ANC. And the disillusionment now is stronger with the ANC than it was with the Nats in the late 80s, I think. We have no one standing up. Anyone with a microphone? No? Perhaps if we look beyond 1994, oh, sorry, 2024, the 29th of May, we've had some conversations which were not negative. It's not necessary. I've, I've said to you, wow, you've really depressed me now. But actually, you, you explained to me why it isn't a depressing scenario that you've painted or that is likely to happen. Could you just unpack that for us? No, I'm not quite sure what you want. Well... 29th of May, AN, the Socialist Parties take over. ANC-EFF alliance happens. Mm. Many of the people in this room are going to say, I'm packing my bags. Goodbye. I'm not coming back. Off. I'm going to Europe. I'm never coming back to South Africa. Your view is, maybe that's not, not actually the smart call. Would you tell us what well, you would do? Well, look, in the case of ANC-EFF, and I suspect it applies to uh, ANC, MK as well. Look, it's first of all, both Malema and Zuma have made it clear that they dislike and despise Ramaphosa. So it's very difficult to see Ramaphosa steering his party into coalition with either of them. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's, it's an obstacle. But the other thing is this, is if you just think of ANC, EFF, I think the situation that creates is very similar to when uh, Zuma made Van Royen finance minister. That is to say, you would immediately get capital flight, you would get panic in city boardrooms, and you would get an overwhelming uh, pressure from the business community saying, this is intolerable, this is, makes the whole country uninvestable, and uh, if you carry on with this, then all bets are off. And in that sense, I can't see that sort of government lasting more than a very short time, uh, because I think that the pressures against it financially and economically would be overwhelming. 
and um, quite apart from the fact that it would increase secession as pressures in not only Western Cape but KZN. And um, I, I just think that, you know, that's got to be taken into account. Uh, that uh, So if that were to happen, I'd say wait and see. Give it a couple of weeks and see whether it's still <laughs> happening because I, I wouldn't be confident. You've mentioned secession of the West, Western Cape. We're going to be having a session and maybe a little more this afternoon on that particular topic. Is it, is it uh, I, I think uh, for Craig's question is, is it a viable proposition or just a fool's errand? Well, that's not something I can really reflect on because it's a, you know, uh, <laughs> it's an idea which uh, is not a fact, you know, it, it's uh Obviously, anyone who wants to envisage secession has to think about, you know, how does it work practically, leaving aside the national government's attitude towards it. But I mean, at the moment, we're part of a national electricity grid, for what it's worth. Uh, what happens then? Do we have to set up our own regional electricity grid? How do we disconnect? The same thing of the tax system. I mean, the practical difficulties are enormous. And uh, I haven't got any more idea about that than anyone else. If you have cast your mind forward 10 years, given you've, and that's what investors like to do, is they like to see through the short term. If you go forward 10 years, what, might, what kind of scenario could you see occurring there? Well, that's very hard. Um, Look, the thing that uh, really uh, I, I, I'm most conscious of is that, look, we've had in the last couple of weeks water cutoffs in Durban and also in Joburg and no doubt many other smaller towns around the country. Now, if that can't be dealt with relatively quickly and effectively, those cities will die. I mean, no city can live for very long without water. Uh, and that is the biggest crisis that the country faces and the most immediate one uh, is the threat to South Africa as an urban civilization. And, um, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is, but something will have to happen long before 10 years from now. And this immigration wave to the Western Cape, is there anything to, to perhaps reverse that or slow it? Not that I can see. Um, and look, the population of Cape Town has increased over 27% since 2011, which isn't that far away, you know. Um, and it's going on. Of course, what, what is very difficult about it is that when people talk about semigration, they're thinking about more or less well-off people from Joburg or elsewhere moving down and setting up in Constantia or somewhere like that. Whereas, in fact, the much larger uh, semigration is uh, black people from the Eastern Cape. And, um, you know, that, that is going on all the time and, and in larger numbers. And uh, it is very rational because the rate of unemployment is more than 10% lower in the Western Cape than it is in the rest of the country. So from that point of view, you know, you're moving towards where the jobs are. So I can't see that stopping quickly. The extraordinary thing is that the migration to Joburg is still bigger. But of course, it's often international. And those patterns have been set up over donkey's years, you know, and they're not going to stop at all quickly. And yet they're moving towards a city which is less and less able to cope with it. Final question. Gaden McKenzie was quite outspoken about the fact that, that Western Cape is gone for the DA, in his view. Do you agree? No. No, I don't. Um, I think that the demographic factor which I've just mentioned uh, is in play. And um, it, it does look to me as if both the EFF and the ANC will do better in the Western Cape uh, this election than they did last time, which I suspect is because of demographic reasons, finally. Um, but I don't know. Uh, but uh, it, 
The data I'm looking at suggests that the DA will still be the dominant part. Mr Johnson, thank you.